Uh, outside of the, the host meal, uh, which was the big manufacturing, um, where most of the manufacturing jobs were in Philadelphia, agriculture has always been very important to Philadelphia. Uh, and I guess it started to die out in the last 40 years somewhat. But uh, before then, it, it seemed like when you went to Philadelphia, you, you went from farm to farm to farm. And since Ruth, your family, you grew up uh, on a farm, uh, tell us a little bit about the farming life. Well, it goes back to the very early days of the Hiawassee Purchase when the settlers first started coming across uh, the river after the Cal President Calhoun opened it up in 1820. The base economy of East Tennessee and particularly Loudoun County was farming. We. Uh, in my lifetime, we were a beef cattle and tobacco farm. We had had some dairy cows earlier in this century. And if you drive through the country still, you can see there were dozens of those small concrete block dairy barns. Mm -hmm. All Many, many farms had a very small, probably not grade A, but some grade uh, dairy. And I believe at this point in 2020, there are three dairy farms in Loudoun wow. County, but they are among the three largest in the state. Someone told me recently, and I'd have to double check my figures to verify, that we are the number one dairy county in the state with three dairies because of the size. Steve Harrison, John Harrison, and the Davis Brothers Farm mm -hmm. are the three dairies So, and are uh, huge operations with a couple of thousand cows for the Harrison brothers each, uh, less than a thousand I think for the Davis farm. But the scope of agriculture has changed so much. Uh, a lot of those little dairy farms uh, in those little concrete block bu buildings, they probably had 20 or 30 cows. And at first milked them by hand, of course. And then, uh, Agriculture has changed with research and development and electricity and all the modern things, but agriculture for the large part when my growing up years was subsistence farming. You made enough to eat and get by and uh, if you worked hard and did, and, and did well. It was not a lucrative existence, but it was mm -hmm. what people knew. People did not have a lot of uh, advanced education, although the schools were excellent in Philadelphia. They had more of a classical education then than we have now. They had music and piano and Latin mm -hmm. and studied the classics and had excellent schools for the time. They would be excellent for our time, but uh, dairy, beef cattle, tobacco, uh, and I know there's a lot of controversy over tobacco in this day and time. Uh, I can list all the pros and all the cons, but it's a little like Mr. Waller and his good deeds. If we had not had tobacco, we would not survive. Mm -hmm. we, we, had, we could buy groceries because we had an acre or two of tobacco, mm -hmm. and that was, uh, that was the cash crop. The thing that was so amazing that I did not realize till I grew up uh, was so different from the rest of the world was that we had two paychecks a year. You got a check in October when you took your calves to the market, and you got a check in December when you sold your tobacco at Sweetwater at the uh, tobacco auction. And as little as we had, we never ran out of money. You did not buy anything you could not afford. You bought the bare necessities. And one of the and you never talked about it, of course, being Scotch Irish. Nobody in <laughs> your families may have Irish. You didn't talk about those kind of things. But the, one of the hardest things I ever did was filling out the financial aid form to go to UT because I had to ask questions that I had never mm -hmm. asked before. And I think our net income that year was a little over $1,600. And I went to UT and my finance professor told me it was impossible for a family to have lived on that amount of money. The, I looked it up one time, the poverty rate for a family of four in that year was $4,000. Wow. 
and uh, we never did without. Mm -hmm. We just made do. And uh, my Uncle Frank was wise and somebody that came back from who had really lived there and grew up there and returned to Philadelphia in retirement. He had a PhD in chemistry and helped invent cellophane at Newt DuPont, but he came back and he asked my Uncle Frank one day, he said, can a man make a living raising beef cattle in Philadelphia, Tennessee? And my wise Uncle Frank said, no, but he can live on what he makes if he's careful. That's good, that's good. What are your memories of farms in Philadelphia? Uh, we didn't live on a farm, but I got my share of farm work. I uh, had uncle, he had uh, some cattle and so on. We'd go out and I'd help him. As back when you still shopped corn, and actually we hauled loose hay, and it was no fun loading with a pitchfork up on the wagon. We had to mow it and all the things went with it. Helped him cut tobacco, which I didn't like to spear the tobacco, so that was a job I avoided. I really didn't like to hang it either up in the top part of the barn. Another hard job and helped, uh, worked a lot with Hal McCrary. Uh, Hal had a large farm and had a lot of hay to haul. And so several of the people my age that time, we were like 10, 11, 12, 13, would help haul hay and so on. Gave us a little bit of spending money. and uh, All the boys did at the at, at time though, didn't they? Yeah, yeah every, 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 every kid was, now we had some free time, that's for sure, but, <laughs> but we had a lot, uh, we had ways of making money. I guess the main way I made any money was picking blackberries. Mm -hmm. Everything, not every acre was under cultivation, so you got out, you walked around, you. Of course, you finally learned where all of the better places were to go pick blackberries. And then always had a ready market for the berries, bring them back in. My next door neighbor, Miss Evelyn, she always would take a two gallon bucket of blackberries. Well, there was a dollar. 50 cents a gallon. 50 cents a gallon is what we got. And, uh, and now if we picked, found some dewberries, we got 60 cents a gallon, so it was a little bit better. But you had to bend over to pick those. They had trailing pines. so. Uh, farm work was hard, air conditioning was non-existent, uh, you just did it and I never, I really still despised to have to go out and shop corn, you always <laughs> waited until it was getting dry and if you were out there with short sleeves, you'd, it was, then of course you would get real unfortunate and you would end up with a pack saddle sting or two, if you've ever been stung with those, they hang around corn and they'll get you. <laughs> Whose farm do you remember? Oh, my goodness. Well, my grandfather and father had a farm on Highway 11. The, I'm ashamed to say one of the only things I re really remember. At 3.30, we would go to my grandmother Waller's and wait on our grandfather to get home, and he would always go to the farm, and he would let all of us ride in the back of his pickup <laughs> to go to the farm. So we got to play around the farm while he was there, and uh, he would always have us home in time for supper. But I'm sorry to say I don't have a lot of experience <laughs> except play he on would, the farm. On the farm there, he would, they would gather <laughs> corn. Mm -hmm. And I remember helping uh, Miss Evelyn They'd bring in a huge barrel of corn. Mm -hmm. And I'd go up and just to be, since she was my next door neighbor, I'd just go up and she enjoyed having a little help. So I would shut, help, help her shut the corn and when it came in on certain days. And then, of course, she would freeze it, and, and that's what they ate. Yeah. Enjoyed that during the, the winter months. I will have to tell you, I remember, and Robert helped me out, the thrashers would come. And I don't know who the thrashers were exactly, but I know my mother cooked for days. And at lunchtime, they would come to our house, and she would set out two huge picnic tables full of food for the thrashers mm -hmm. and they'd sit around and uh, eat lunch and then they'd go back to the farm. 
That was a, I guess Ruth, you all had with, the same Miller experience. Had, and if I think on it for a while, I'll tell you who owned the thrashing machine. But, yes, they, <laughs> but they traveled. Yes, they moved they from traveled, farm to farm. And you, know. you were required, I guess, to give them lunch. Yeah. And Mother would cook forever. And maybe it was one day or two days, but you know, not they weren't there long. They had to move on to other farms, mm -hmm. but no one farm could afford the equipment to thrash right. for thrashing okay. your uh, your own crop because it was so expensive. So the mm -hmm. thrashers moved from farm to farm. Uh, we talked a little bit about the railroad a few moments ago, and uh, you know the railroad was important to agriculture. In Very much so. That's how they moved their product. Yeah, livestock and. Yeah, this, lumber and timber and staves mm -hmm. and acid wood and uh, yeah. Brown. From what I understand, the the stockyard closed in 1952 and the depot closed in 1960. Yes, that that's close. I remember loading the, the stockyard was just right beside the old red building there, mm -hmm. and had a cattle chute, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, people would <clears throat> bring their cattle in and. There was a side track there, we called it a side track or siding. And train would then they'd move a cattle car in, it was a, a, one of the freight trains, drop a cattle car off there, and then they'd load the cattle. And then usually then the next train coming would probably pick it up, the next train going in the, the direction they needed to go because it was took too long just to load the car for the train to wait. So, and out of the the big red storage building, uh, they did have uh, Albert McCray in the later years. He stored some of his merchandise and so on in there. He said he went through probably <clears throat> the merchandise about eight, the equivalent of that building filled eight times in a year, mm -hmm. which would have been a lot of merchandise in that, in that large building there. Uh, it was a building when I just may not remember playing in there a little bit, but it was it was a kind of an off limit place. Yeah. Yeah. And before our days, uh, uh, we mentioned all those dairy farmers. Well, what did they do with all that milk? They hauled it to the train station, mm -hmm. and a lot of it went to Sweetwater. Had a cheese factory at one time. I think it was probably long before our. Yeah. I, I've still got a, a milk crate, I don't, a, a, I don't cheese, a wooden mm -hmm. cheese box yeah. with five pound loaf of cheese. Oh. Che I don't have a cheese. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't remember it, but that was the and that they took it to the train station. In fact, one of the uh, most educated, well-known members of the community, uh, Reverend uh, Hyden who had been superintendent of schools in Loudoun at one time, uh, lived out on Fort Creek Road. In about 1900, he was killed at the railroad track with his team, take Hall and cream to the uh, milk to the and cream to the train. Wow. So. Anything else on the depot or train station? Well, what was it called, Robert, when the train would bring uh, the men to work on the railroad tracks. Section gang. And they would have four yeah, or five cars that would <clears> park <throat> there, and we were never allowed to get out of the house when those uh, workmen mm -hmm. were there. And so my friend and I decided we would see what they were doing, and we went through the cars with one of the men, and it was perfectly fine. but. Um, I'll just have to say, I certainly was punished for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, I've got, there's a story, and I don't, I think I know it to be true, but you all maybe can uh, verify this. We can edit it out if it's not. Uh, there was a tragedy in Philadelphia on that side track. The workmen were there. They called them shanty cars, I shanty think, cars, that they lived on. Right. Mm -hmm. And somebody made a mistake somewhere, and the person in the depot had to make a horrible decision. There were two trains coming, mm -hmm. and one of them had to be, they, they could either have a train wreck or cut, they could divert one into the shanty cars, and he diverted them. Wow. Now, 
Is that? I never heard that. I'm, I, I don't th doubt that story. I don't I think recall I, I think having it, heard that. It was before our time, but I well, think I somewhere think it I, have was, a, uh, I have a little newspaper Ray article. Peoples husband. That King Peoples. Yes. It was. That, it, it yes, was. yes, I've mm -hmm. heard that story what many an times. Awful, what an awful decision yeah. to have to make. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, the, the section cars, when they were parked over there on the side track, why, as Ann mentioned, had lots of workers. <clears throat> and if you've been through Philadelphia, you know, crossing the houses on Elm Street there, you have a lot, so we call it, over on the lot. And so they would kind of make themselves at home on the lot mm -hmm. from time to time. and. Mm -hmm. And never had any problems that I ever recall. They, but uh, they sometimes they kept late hours and mm -hmm. so on. But uh, it was a couple of weeks they were there, and then yeah. we also had mm -hmm. hobos. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, we haven't <coughs> talked about the hobos. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, Jim's grandmother, Miss Blanche McCrary, would feed the hobos, mm -hmm. and my grandmother. Maybe I shouldn't put this in the pack. We'll we'll run go, them off with ahead. a broom. <laughs> it's just the difference uh, between our grandmother and our guests. Well, my grandmother was afraid of her shadow, so she certainly wasn't going to feed a hobo. Yeah. But I can remember them very well yes. coming to our house. Oh, I remember them knocking. They'd always somehow get around to the back of uh -huh. our house and knock on the back door, and my mother would always at least give them a sandwich. And yeah, no, I can't some, remember something. my grandmother. Because the doors were locked either. Oh, no, never, no. never. And the windows were open. No. Yeah. Really, we never lived in fear in mm -hmm. Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. I, my years. I mean, no, I lived in 57, never. basically, mm -hmm. you know, to go to college, but uh, we we just never, we didn't know quite how to what fear was. No, <laughs> and we would go to bed at night. Your front door would be open. The windows would be open to get the fresh air. Mm -hmm. and you never thought about locking a door. Mm -hmm. 